السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته متابعي مجلة أسواق عبر فيسبوك ويوتيوب أهلا وسهلا بكم في بث مباشر جديد عبر صفحتنا على فيسبوك وحسابنا على موقع يوتيوب اليوم نحن لدينا بث مباشر مع الدكتور الأخصائي yeah. جراحة دكتور سيفا موهن وهو أخصائي طب النساء وطب الولادة في مشفى كي بي جي دمنسارة دكتور ويلكم Yeah, well, thank you for having me. Good evening. Thank you so much. Thank you for your time today. Doctor, can you first please introduce us to your specialty as a doctor and your work at KPJ Damansara? Uh, well, I'm an obstetrician and gynecologist. I've been with KPJ uh, Group for the last 25 years. I've been working as a consultant obstetrician and gynecologist. And my special interest is, uh, apart from general obstetrics and gynecology, is on women's cancer per se and i start specialize in women's cancer and i also involved in a keyhole surgery that means laparoscopic surgeries that so these are my two subspecialty interests apart from general obstetrics and gynecology Uh, just to notice to our audience who are watching right now, if you have any questions, any inquiries you want to ask, doctor, please you can post it in the comments and we will ask it to the doctor during this live stream. Uh, doctor, my first question will be about uh, the common problems that come with period. What are the main problems that women face uh, related to period? What are the most common these problems and what are the causes behind these problems? So, you know, women uh, usually get their menses, uh, the first menses we call minaki, usually around the age of 12, 13. <clears throat> and when they get their periods during the first time, usually they may have a little bit of pain and the periods may not be regular for the first couple of months. That is very, very normal in every young girl. But when the, uh, periods are established, and uh, when the normal period is usually about five to seven days every 28 days cycle but what happens is some women uh, the pain is very very bad especially even before period during period or even after menses and the flow can be very heavy in some women so the common causes of heavy periods or painful periods could be many but one of the common ones is called endometriosis what happens is in the, this women about 20 to 30 percent of women suffer from this condition called endometriosis typically they will have pain before period during period as well as after period as well and uh, normally when the uh, normal pain is usually for the first or second day but in these patients who have severe menses or painful period uh, sometimes they may not be able to do their routine work. They may not be able to go to class or they may not be able to go to work. And uh, they may have to sometimes have nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, or sometimes they even have to go to the doctor for an injection. Normal painkillers may not help. So one of the common conditions is says endometriosis. So what does endometriosis mean? Endometriosis mean usually the womb has got three lining. An inner lining is called endometrium. And only this lining can bleed every month. But unfortunately, in some women, this lining is also present outside the womb because of some developmental error. While they, they were in the mother's womb, this lining, which is only present in the inner lining of the womb, sometimes can be present outside the womb. So when they have menses every month, they are not only bleeding from the womb, they are also bleeding outside, especially mm -hmm. around the ovaries, the eggs. And this blood cannot come out. So the old blood, which is iron, gets oxidized, mm -hmm. becomes rusty. So it looks like chocolate. So they uh -huh. call it it's an extremely painful condition. Okay. So this condition is very, very painful. So this is one of the causes. And then there's another common cause is fibroids. Fibroids are non-cancerous growth. They are small lumps in the uterus and mm -hmm. they can cause heavy bleeding during menses. And they also be associated with pain in some conditions. So these are the two main common conditions, endometriosis and fibroid uterus. And fibroids mm -hmm. can be 
either single or many fibre rods in single loop. I can show you some pictures after this. this. Yes, doctor, I think uh, you have some slides you want to show us and the audience, I think. Uh, let me, let us show them these slides. Uh, I think we will try to share the screen from Dr. Screen so we can show to the audience the slide that Dr. Siva was talking about. As you can see here. As you can see here. As you can see here, this is the brain. And this part of the brain called the pituitary gland is the one which sends hormones down every month. And there are two hormones from the brain and two hormones from the ovaries every month. And you can see here, this is the two hormones from the brain. When it goes up, the egg is released. And once the egg is released, the ovaries will produce two more hormones and then it comes down. So this is a typical 28 days cycle. So you see here, the lining is thin. After ovulation, the lining gets thick. And if you don't get pregnant, this lining sheds off and this is called the menstrual blood. So mm -hmm. this lining is called endometrium. And this is the only lining which can bleed. But unfortunately, in some women, this lining is present outside the womb. Outside the womb, especially in the ovaries. And I'll show you a slide here. Go back to the slide. Okay. Mm -hmm. And we go back to the, I'll just show you here, what does endometriosis mean? We'll just show you what endometriosis is. Okay. So you can see here, this is the womb, this is the ovary, and this is the tube. Actually, it's not and showing, I, actually. Not showing? We still, yeah, we still do not see it. We don't see the slide. I think we can't show this slide. We'll try again one more time. Okay, we can. So, so okay, can. I can't show the slide, but that is uh, end of it. It's a video, actually. I don't know why it's not showing here. Okay. So, doctor, uh, what, what I want to ask is how common are these problems that you just mentioned, we talked about? How okay. common are they in normal women? See, typically, when a woman starts having a period at the age of 12, she menstruates every month until the age of 50. Okay. And nature is created in such a way that the womb has to rest in between of every few years. So those days, people used to have early marriage and conceive at least four or five children on an average. So each time they have a child or each time they get pregnant, they don't have menses for nine months. And typically, if they breastfeed the child, they may not have menses for another five to six months. So for every child, the womb is resting about a year to a year and a half. And when they have four or five children, so the womb is resting for about seven to 10 years during this age of 12 to 50. Mm -hmm. So nowadays, women are postponing marriage due to work, commitments, career, etc. And even they marry, they postpone having married children. And even when they have children, they may only have one or two children. So in other words, late marriages, postponing of having children, etc., etc. The hormones that are re released every month, bombard the uterus. And this uterus then begins to swell, produce uh, fibroids, and things like endometriosis and so on. 
because when you don't have menses for a while, you're actually resting the womb. And the natural way to rest the womb from all these hormones is to get pregnant and have babies. So there are different hormones when you're pregnant. They are just the opposite hormones when you don't have, uh, when you have your normal periods. So nature has created women in such a way that when they have children, the womb is resting in between. Okay, And that, those days, about 30, 40 years ago, we didn't see that many fibroids. We didn't see that many endometriosis and so on. So these are more common these days, especially in women who are not married or who are married but have no children or the number of children is very less, one or two children. So you just mentioned that the latency in marriage and getting pregnant, having kids, has a negative effect on this situation. My question yes. is here, my question is, what are the medical or practical solutions for this situation, instead of getting married early, of course? Sure. Uh, we do see many patients. In fact, nowadays, about 30 to 40 percent of women have some sort of endometriosis or blood clots in the ovaries, or outside the ovaries. And some of, quite a number of them come with fibroids and etc. etc. because of these conditions that show you the, the fact that women are postponing marriage and so on. But of course, um, there are treatment for all these conditions. And example for fibroids, uh, it depends on the how severe the symptoms, the number of fibroids, the location of the fibroids, whether the patient's married or not married, whether the patient has children or no children. There are so many factors. So depending on all these factors, we treat according to the needs of the patient. If the patient is young and she's not married or she's keen to have a child, we can just remove the fibroids. We can just remove the fibroids. And these days, we can do it in a very simple keyhole surgery. That means instead of opening up the abdomen, we make three tiny holes through the camera, uh, what we call a laparoscopic method. We can remove the fibroid and actually suck it up and then stitch back the uterus. And this way, the hospital stay is very short. Patient's recovery is very fast. Pain, post-op pain is very less and they're able to recover very, very fast. It doesn't matter whether they have one or two or three or four fibroids. Um, in most cases, we can do the surgery through laparoscopic method, keyhole method. And if the patient's got endometriosis or cyst, cyst usually occurs in the ovary. And when I talk mm -hmm. about endometriosis, we call it blood cyst. It's a very painful condition. We can easily treat this condition through laparoscopy as well. We do the, put the camera, put instruments, look at the ovary, and then just take out the cyst and stitch back the ovary. So this conditions can be easily managed through a laparoscopic surgery. Okay. okay. So, uh, so what is what is, what is the what percentage, is the percentage of, of, uh, of the cases that need surgery from all these? Well, if the fibroids are small and they're not causing much problem, we can treat these patients with some painkillers and some mild uh, analgesics to control the pain. And if the bleeding is a little bit too much, there are certain medications we can give to be taken during menses to reduce the blood flow. But these are in conditions where the fibroids are very small. Uh, even in endometriosis, we can give certain medication to lessen the pain. In some patients, we want to stop the period for six months to nine months with medication. But these medications are not too good in the long term. So mm -hmm. for a short term, we can treat with medications. But if they keep coming back or the pain is very severe or the cyst is too big or the fibroids are getting bigger, there's no choice but to do surgery. surgery. And in young women, we try our best to save the uterus and save the ovaries. But in some patients who have completed the family in the old age group, it keeps coming back. Sometimes we have to remove the womb or the ovaries. Uh, to give a permanent cure for these patients. Clear. Uh, doctor, we can move here to another question. We have many situations where both the partners, the husband and the wife, are healthy. They don't have any problems with... Uh, they don't have... I mean, they don't have physical problems of uh, the ability to reproduce or have kids. But we have situations where women are having 
or the family in general is having problems to conceive. What are the main reasons behind behind this difficulties if there's no serious health problem that is causing difficulties to conceive or to get pregnant? Okay, in, in my experience, um, one out of four married couples will come to see us. 25% couple of the couple, married couples, will come to see us with problem of conception, in a, un, unable to conceive, uh, even after trying for a year or two. But not all these patients need medical attention. To be very frank, out of this 25% of women or couples coming to us, only about 10% of them really need help in terms of checking their tubes or sperm tests and so on. About 80 to 90% of them is basically due to stress. Stress. Stress can affect your menses. Stress can affect your fertility. Stress can affect the quality of the eggs. Stress can affect the quality of the sperm. And in many societies, especially Asian societies, uh, if somebody doesn't conceive by six months to a year after marriage, that seems to be a little bit of pressure, especially from yes. parents, from relatives, uh, sisters, and especially in certain communities, if the younger sister gets pregnant before the elder sister was married much longer, the pressure yes. is intense. And those days when no modern technology was available, uh, if you don't conceive for four or five years, they say you go and adopt a child and you will conceive. The reason is nothing scientific. When you adopt a child, your concentration now comes to the child and the brain begins to rest. And there's not no so much of a stress to your brain. Mm -hmm. and everything goes back to normal and you try to you get pregnant. The important thing to know is a lot of couples think uh, they, if they try for one, two months, they should get pregnant. Not everyone's lucky to get pregnant first or second attempt. Usually it takes some time. Even if everything is perfect with the husband, everything is perfect with the wife, there's no problem with sex, no problem with the tubes, no problem with the ovulation, the sperm count is perfect. At the end of one year of trying, only about 70% will get pregnant, accumulated pregnancy rate. So that's another 30% who will take a little bit longer than one year. But by two years, most women or most couples should get a, a baby in most cases. But in a, putting it another way, if 100 couples are trying in any one month, perfect timing, perfect setting, only 15 to 20% will get pregnant. Not all 100% will get pregnant. And this, so is, this, is, this is the normal percentage, right? Yes, then this is a, a message that everybody should understand that not everybody gets pregnant within the first or second time. Some people take a little bit longer. Sometimes putting unnecessary stress may make it worse. So the key word is to relax and, uh, and accept the fact that you may take some time. But usually after a year of trying, we may want to do some simple tests and uh, we will start investigating, uh, looking at the husband. We can even start with certain simple medication like fertility tablets, and usually about after two or three cycles, about 30 to 40 percent of couples will get pregnant, or women will get pregnant. Those who don't get pregnant, only then we will start checking the tube, checking the ovary, checking the uterus, checking the, the husband's sperm count, and so on. And um, in some certain situations where the, there is, the sperm count is extremely low, or when the tube is blocked, uh, even you can't open the tubes with the surgery and so on, we may have to do procedures like what we call assisted reproductive techniques, like IUI, test tube babies, and so on. But mm -hmm. actually, to be very frank, only a small percentage of patients will need these procedures in our experience. Uh, clear. Doctor, uh, can we move to talk about tumors? We hear a lot about tumors in the womb, tumors in the reproductive system of uh, the female reproductive system. Can you tell us what are the most common tumors, not the cancerous yeah. one, and how dangerous yeah. are they? The word tumor means neoplasia, new growth. Okay, so tumor doesn't mean cancer. 
tumor just says that it could be either a benign or non-cancerous tumor and the other one is called malignant or cancerous tumor so there are two types of tumors so when people talk about tumors not necessarily every tumor is cancerous there are some tumors which are non-cancerous and some tumors that are cancerous a good example is fibroid fibroids i can show you here I'll just show you here. Yes. Let's show you the slides. So, doctor is going to show us the slides about the non cancerous uh, tumors. Can you see the slide? Can you see the slide now? Yes, doctor, we can see it clearly now. Yeah, so the word tumor, also known as neoplasia, there is new growth. It can be either benign or non cancerous and malignant or cancerous. So the word tumor doesn't mean cancer. Tumor can be either be non cancer or cancerous. Mm -hmm. And the okay. size doesn't matter. This is an example of a womb with many, many fibroids. You can see here. There are many fibroids. One, two, it's, in fact, this patient has got about 30 over fibroids. And when you look at it, it looks huge, it looks frightening. But this is not a cancer. This is a benign fibroid. You can see here, there is a nice clear margin in each of these tumor. So in non-cancerous tumor, they are well defined. You can actually, if you want to save the womb, we just take out these fibroids separately. But in this case, the patient's got so many fibroids and uh, she's completed a family. She's 47 years old. So we have just removed the womb. But you can see there are so many fibroids. So size doesn't matter. Sometimes patients come with a huge mass in the abdomen and they're worried it's cancer. It may not be cancer. But in some cases, this is a case of a tumor, a cancerous growth. The womb is not very big, just slightly bigger than normal size. But this patient has got a cancerous growth. So the important thing to remember is uh, tumors, the size doesn't matter. Sometimes oh. they can be small and can be cancerous. Sometimes they can be big as this and can be non non-cancerous. So it's important. To, so if I talk about uh, cancers, the there are three important cancers in the female reproduction. Okay. The first is, I'll show you again the slide. Okay. So, doctor, in the case you mentioned where the, as you said, it's benign, it's not cancerous. Is removing these tumors, is it dangerous for the health of the, no, of the patient? No, if they are not cancerous, uh, we can either just remove the, the, the fibroid or the cyst and they'll be perfect after that. A benign or non-cancerous tumor will never become cancerous. If uh -huh. it's cancerous, it's right from the beginning. If it becomes cancerous later, it, the diagnosis in the first place is wrong. Uh, so it's important to know a non-cancerous tumor, it will not become cancer. A benign growth will not become cancerous. It is okay. cancerous. Cancer can just start from the right from the beginning. Okay, that's very important to understand that uh, cancers are not uh, a single disease. Uh, now, coming to cancers, um, uh, there are three different cancers that we can talk of. One is 
the 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 most common cancer in women is what we call cervical cancer okay if, if you can see here can you see this yes we can see it so this is the womb and the lower part of it the lower part of it here this lower part is called the cervix the lower uh, neck of the womb okay. so the neck of the womb it looks exactly like this the lower part of the womb okay this cancer is called cervical cancer is unfor unfortunately the most common cancer in women in the developing countries in the poor countries but this cancer is 100% preventable it's important to know that this cancer is 100% preventable why unlike most cancers this got a pre cancer stage a pre cancer stage we call it cin cervical intraepithelial neoplasia this pre cancer stage we have got pre cancer 1 pre cancer 2 pre cancer 3 which if not treated becomes cancerous and this pre cancer stage will look exactly perfectly normal even to the doctor's eyes only by doing a pap smear that means you are perfect you go to a doctor and say doctor i want to do a pap smear and a doctor will do a pap smear by just taking a little bit of scraping imagine this is the cervix this is a special brush he puts it here and just takes a 360 degrees turning and then it drops these cells in this fluid and mm -hmm. then this taken to the lab and they do a special staining look under the microscope and they'll tell you whether it's normal or there are some abnormal cells these abnormal cells are not does not mean it's cancer it means it's in the pre-cancer stage and when it's in the pre-cancer stage we do a corposcopy a special examination under microscope and we can treat this lesion within 10 minutes using laser or a thing called loop excision we just cut off this area so this cancer is actually 100 percent preventable how do you prevent it by doing a pap smear regularly especially in women who are married okay so we advise them at least you must do this pap smear at least once in two years even though so, you don't have any symptoms nothing because in the pre-cancer stage you won't have any symptoms and the cervix will look perfect to the eyes only by doing the pap smear under the microscope you can detect the abnormal cells and if there's abnormal cells and pre-cancer stage it can be treated within 10 minutes as an outpatient so it's a preventable cancer and nowadays we also know that this cancer is associated with a virus which is called human papilloma virus hpv virus and mm -hmm. we have some vaccines so nowadays even the youngest children who are going to the school age of 17 15 to 17 years we can give them the injection to prevent the virus infection so we have a vaccine against this virus called hpv and this virus is responsible or this is the virus which can cause pre-cancer and cancer so it can be prevented by two methods nowadays we can even give a vaccine but even if you do give the vaccine you still have to do a pasmia but you need not do every year you can do every once in three or four years instead mm -hmm. of doing one to two years so okay. if you have not done the vaccine you can still do the pasmia but if you don't do the pasmia and then you start having a growth it becomes a cancer and cancer is as you know is not easy to treat and again cancer is early early detection in the stage one or two it can, can be treated be. stage three and four whatever we do it's not 100 percent curable so the key word to remember is prevention especially prevention. going for plasmia or taking the vaccine in the young age group that's okay. cervical cancer unfortunately so cervical unfortunately, cancer 90 percent of cancers of cervix the patients never even had a single pap smear so that's mm. why it's the poorer countries where they don't have access to pap smears yes. okay that's cervical cancer this is the only cancer which is 100 percent preventable the next cancer as you can see here it can come from the ovaries the two eggs here 
These mm -hmm. two ovaries are the size of a walnut, very small, and they're deep inside the abdomen. Okay. And unfortunately, not like here, Pesmia, which is easily accessible and easy to do, there's no specific screening. There are some cancer markers like CA125, but they are not specific or sensitive. So uh, normal doesn't mean no cancer. Raised CA125 doesn't mean cancer. It can be due to other conditions like fibroid or infection. So mm -hmm. we don't have a very good screening method. And 70% of our women, by the time they come to us, they are already in stage three or four. So this is a big problem. And this problem is still the same. Even 30 years ago, it was the same. My exam question when I sat for my exams is on this ovarian cancer. The same question is asked even now because the diagnosis is usually very late. 70% 70, 70 of them come in stage three or four. So what can you do to prevent this? Go for regular checkups. So even once a year or two years, even though you go for the pasmia, the doctor will do a scan, especially a transvaginal scan, have a look at the ovaries and make sure that you're okay. Once in a while, you can do a cancer marker, CA125. But frankly, uh, still today, with all the modern technologies, 70% of ovarian cancers, we see them at stage three or four. So we don't have a good preventive method. To detect the third, third common cancer is the cancer. Just now I spoke to you about the neck of the womb. Mm -hmm. The same womb in the lining here, you can have another cancer called endometrial cancer. So it's important to know the uterus or the womb has got two types of cancer. The lower part is called the neck and called the cervical cancer, which can occur in any age. The peak age is about 35 to 45 for the cervical cancer. Ovarian cancer also can occur any age, but okay. more common okay. after, after menopause. This endometrial cancer is typically 98% of them come after menopause. So mm -hmm. the typical history is, doctor, I had no periods for five years. I menopause for five years. I'm 55 now. Now I'm having bleeding. I'm having abnormal bleed. And then we do a scan. We look at the lining. We can do a biopsy. Take a tissue from this lining. Uh -huh. Even in the clinic, we can pass a small catheter and take a tissue. Or even if you're worried, we can take you to the operation theater and do a diagnostic. We can put a camera in, have a look. We call it hysteroscopy and do a biopsy on the lining here. And if it's cancerous, we have to remove the womb and the ovaries. But these cancers usually come in early stage because there's some early warning sign. Typically, okay. no periods for five years or three years or four years. Anybody who has got no period for more than one year and start bleeding, we have to rule out. But it doesn't mean that everyone who bleeds after menopause is having cancer. Only about four to five percent have this problem. The other 95 percent can bleed because of sudden hormone uh, in, from the ovaries, even though after menopause, or sometimes some blood vessels would have cracked inside the lining and you bleed because of some old blood vessels that have cracked. So it does, doesn't mean every any woman who bleeds after menopause has got endometrial cancer, only about 5% are at high risk. But every woman who is menopause for more than a year, having bleeding, must see the gynecologist to exclude this cancer. So these are the three main common cancers in the in this area. Of course, the other cancer is breast cancer. It's very another mm -hmm. uh, common cancer in women. So in the gynecological organ, there are three cancers, the cervical cancer, ovarian cancer, and the endometrial cancer. Cancer from the tubes, vagina, and the vulva are very, very rare. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. what we need to know is breast cancer and this ovarian, endometrial, and cervical. And cervical cancer is 100% preventable by going okay. to okay. regular pasmia. So regarding so, these, regarding this, these uh, three main cancers that you mentioned, doctor, if predicted early or uh, the doctor was able to detect it early, what is the percentage of success in treating these cancers? To be very frank, we can get as almost 100% cure. Mm -hmm. 
early stage. To be very fair, technology now for the mainstay is still surgery. The main mode of treatment is surgery. And if it's in stage one, we don't have to give any more treatment. But even if it's gone to stage two, uh, depending on the cancers, if you have ovarian cancer, we give chemotherapy because these cancers tend to spread very fast. So we give something which can go all over the body. That's called chemotherapy drugs. For, for endometrial cancer as well as cervical cancer, they, they, they are confined to the pelvis most of the time. They don't spread easily to other parts unless they are more advanced. So in the early stages, we, even we have removed the womb, we can give some radiotherapy to these areas. Okay? Or sometimes we combine chemo and radio. Radiotherapy is a, a focused treatment to that area. Okay? Mm -hmm. So the difference between chemo and radio, chemo is a drug given through the vein and it goes to all over the body because those cancers can spread to the lungs, liver and so on. Yes. Radiotherapy is for cancers which are confined to one area. And we zoom on that area and we give radiation to that area. So cervical cancer and endometrial cancers usually don't spread very fast, even in advanced cases. Whereas ovaries tend to spread very fast. So I all I want to say is, <coughs> including breast cancer, the key word is you prevent. If you can't prevent, at least early detection. And the question you asked, I can assure you with modern technology, early cancers can be almost 100% cured. So I want to say, stress this, cancers doesn't mean one single disease. Cancers can occur in almost any part of the body, including your skin, lips, skin, lungs, heart, liver, any part of the body you can have. So cancer is not a single disease. Some cancers tend to spread fast. Some are slow growing cancers and they got different cell types and uh, uh, locations. And some are what you call slow growing cancers. Some can spread fast. So cancer is not a death sentence. Cancer doesn't mean death. Cancer is a curable disease. In some cases, it's preventable, especially cervical cancer. Mm -hmm. them. So uh, of course, it's good to be health conscious. It's good to go for regular checkups. But no woman should be worried about uh, being diagnosed as cancer or, or cancer is equal to death sentence or death or something like that. Because nowadays we have got fantastic medications right from surgery. The techniques of surgery is improved. Uh, uh, the modalities of treatment for adjuvant therapy, either chemotherapy. Uh, we have got immunotherapy nowadays and we have got radiotherapy. And uh, we have got gamma knife and things like that, which can precision. Yes. That means it doesn't destroy the areas around it. So mm -hmm. the growth in a particular area precisely can be treated instead of treating the whole area. So side effects are very less nowadays. So don't have this cancer phobia. And uh, I want to assure women that most cancers, even if you're not able to prevent, if it's detected early, is 100% curable. Mm -hmm. Doctor, can we take some questions from the sure, comments? Sure, sure. Uh, let me start with this question from Miss Amira Amouri. She's saying, what are the bad and good size for hormone bills for menopause women? As it must, uh, and is it, uh, is it a must to take them? Or what are the other options for menopause women aged 60 to 70? Okay, well, this is, I think, a, an excellent question because a lot of women will ask this question because this menopause is something every woman will will will, will encounter. Okay, uh, the age of menopause has not changed. It is around forty nine to 50, 51. and it doesn't. It's not different from a white woman or an Asian woman or an Arabic woman or. It's the same. Uh, in 1850s, in the, those years, the life age or lifespan of a woman is not even 50. A lot of women didn't know what menopause was. But now, the average lifespan of a woman is about 80. 80. So women live about 30 to 
40 years longer than those days. And about 40 to 50% of our life is in the menopause age. So from age of 50 to 80, you will experience menopause. Now, menopause symptoms are not the same with everyone. Just like our fingers are different size, each woman, each individual is different. So in my experience, about 30 to 40% of women will not need any treatment for hormonal changes. They are as perfect as ever. Then we have another 20 to 30% of women in the other extreme. They are totally different personalities. They like gardening, suddenly they don't like to do gardening. They like to cook, suddenly they don't want to cook. They don't want to socialize. They don't want to go to any functions. They become withdrawn. They become very nervous. They, 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 they lose interest in the things. And sometimes the, the relatives and the husbands actually taken them to psychiatrists or psychologists thinking that they have some mental or emotional problem. It's sad because this is the other extreme. And then there's another small percentage of women, about 20%, who need a little bit of help, little bit of help. So what are the symptoms? Most of the time you feel, as I said, about 20-30% will have no symptoms at all. They're perfectly okay. So it depends on your upbringing, your culture, your your way of your psyche towards menopause because some women have this psychological feeling or that once you're menopause, you're useless or menopause means old age. They equate to that. But look at the women these days. You can't tell them their age. It's different. One of the days when, when women reach 50 and they say, oh, it's time for my grandchildren. No more for me. Things have changed a lot over the last 20, 30 years, especially with internet and uh, the globalization of the whole thing. Women have changed over the last 30, 40 years. They want to look good. They want to feel good. And they, they, they want to feel. So as I said, 30, about 30% 30 of women don't need any help. And the other extreme where the patients really need help, I think you must, must start them with hormones. I have so many patients who have actually gone to psychiatrists for treatment, thinking that there's something wrong. So these patients will 100% benefit from hormones. And then there's another group which need a little bit of help, just a little bit to tide over. So we mm -hmm. give them short-term hormones for six months to a year. And if you, there's no such thing as uh, you must take hormones only for six months or one year or two years. Each one is different. So what we usually do is give hormones, those who need it, we give it for at least two years and then slowly we try to stop and see. If it comes back, we can always go back. And there's no age limit. I have seen women in the age of 60, 65 still taking hormones. But of course, hormones are different types, tablets. In the first one, two years, we can give some hormones which cause menstrual bleeding every month. And after two years of menopause, we can give medication which doesn't cause any bleeding. Because I'm sure women don't want to have menses at the age of 55, 60, 70. So we mm -hmm. have different types of hormones. We give them patches. We can give them gel. We can give them oral tablets. We got implants. So we got different modalities, different types of drink. And just like contraception, we have different uh, uh, brands, different dosages of hormones. So we we try to individualize. Each woman is different. So when women come to us, we talk about their symptoms. One of the, some of the common symptoms are hot flashes, mood swings, uh, sometimes uh, sweating, sometimes they have a palpitation of the heart beating faster, and mm -hmm. sometimes they, they, they become very emotional sometimes. So the symptoms can vary from patient to patient. So depending on the symptoms, depending on the hormone levels, and depending on uh, how severe, uh, in patients who don't need it, we don't have to give it. And there are 30, 40 percent who don't need it at all. And those who need it, we give them at least for two years, and then we can always monitor them. And so it is a very good medication or treatment for women who really need it. And whether you can take it at 65, 70, there's no age limit. But as long as you monitor the patients, there are a lot of people mm -hmm. who are scared. Oh, I will take hormones, I'll get breast cancer or this or that. 
Actually, so, this I exaggerate. The treatment here, as you mentioned, doctor, is individualized based on each patient. There is yes. no general. Uh, no, there is no, no general. One okay. size doesn't fit all. Clear. Doctor, we have another question. Many healthy women, even young women, have normal, as you mentioned, normal pain during their monthly period. Um, we have a question that people asking, does uh, painkillers like uh, ibuprofen, brofen, all these kind of painkillers, does it affect the health of the womb if taken to prevent the pains of the period? Yeah. The, the pain of the of menses, okay, every woman may have a little bit of cramps, and especially the first day, uh, first or second day. So mild cramps with no other symptoms like excessive vomiting or nausea or diarrhea or needing to go and take injection or uh, rolling on the bed with hot back on the tummy, or sometimes women uh, can't go to work or skip classes, that are severe. Those are severe. But mild uh, menstrual pain, um, some women want to suffer silently because they are very worried or the parents don't let them take any medication, especially the mothers. They keep mm -hmm. telling them, oh, you, you shouldn't take medication, you shouldn't get used to it, your body will get used to it and so on. I think that is wrong because if you have menstrual pain, there are a lot of medications. We start with very simple ones like like even you talk about paracetamol or Panadol is called it, or, or Panadin, menstrual uh, menstrual uh Panadol. simple medications like this is the first line okay if that doesn't work you can go to a little bit further to ibuprofen or celebrex and so on but what is important is it's not that the womb gets used to it or your body gets used to it some of these medications like especially long-term celebrex or something we take continuously can cause gastric uh irritation and sometimes gastric ulcers and so on but those are patients who are taking it every day for three weeks to four weeks in a row but in when you have slight menstrual cramps one or two days every month should not cause any problem mm -hmm. so there's no reason why you should suffer okay so if you have mild symptoms and most of the time the pain will go away with simple paracetamol panadine or celebrex or even ibuprofen and all that but if the pain is so severe that these drugs don't work and affect your routine life or you may have to go and see a doctor every month or two then you need to be further investigated because we have two types of dysmenorrhea we call primary and secondary primary mm -hmm. means nothing wrong it just most of the primary will go off once you marry and have your children the service get dilated the menstrual flow is good, you may not have any pain. Secondary is due to fibroids or endometriosis or infection or some other cause causing the pain. So secondary ones is usually last throughout the period and sometimes even after the period. The pain may even come before the period. The, the common one or the primary is usually the first or second day. So you can actually differentiate. And if it's not so severe, please don't hold back on your simple painkillers like Panadol or ibuprofen or, or Sandrax mm. and stuff, all very, very safe. Doctor, uh, we hear a lot of questions and maybe narratives that ha put a connection between latency in getting pregnant and ca womb cancers. Is there any connection between late pregnancy and cancer? Does, being, does getting pregnant early in an early age or in a late age, have any connection, any scientific connection with well, getting cancer? I think, again, a very interesting question. This is a very common question which patients ask. Gone are the days, those days, when you talk about 20, 30 years ago, women have their children in the early 20s. By 30, they have completed the family. And, uh, and then uh, they become grandmothers in the, uh, the 40s or early 50s. 80% of our patients sometimes we come to us we're having a second or third child, they're already 35. So women are postponing marriage for so many reasons, career, etc., etc., financial reasons, and so on. But actually, there's no real connection between late marriage, late childbirth, and cancers. You know, so you don't have to worry too much. There's no real scientific data to prove that 
late marriage means higher chance of cancer. Not at all. You don't have to worry too much about that. If there's no real scientific connection. And it's very common nowadays for mothers, first time mothers be in the 30s. And in my experience, 80% of my patients are more than 35 by the time they have their second child or third child. Mm -hmm. So it's not uncommon. So there's no such thing as your high risk of cancer or something like that. Nothing to worry. Okay. It's not uncommon. Doctor, we have another question here is asking, uh, is betadine wash safe for... Uh... Betadine wash, is it safe for vagina? Does these products like wash it, all this, is it safe to use for women? Okay, again, uh, we call this uh, feminine hygiene. And a lot of women are obsessed or because of this market forces. Uh, there are so many industry driven uh, uh, products for women. We've got special menstrual pads, we have douching, we've got lots of, I don't want to name any of them, but uh, they are being promoted actively. But if you can see, nature has provided us with very special bacteria or germs, which actually protect us from infection. We've got very good bacteria in our mouth, in our gut, and especially in the vagina. We have got very good protective germs, lactobacilli, which keeps the vagina acidic and prevents uh, fungal growth, and other infections. So when we do douching with um, uh, any form of uh, feminine hygiene products, we are actually killing off the good germs. We are killing off the good germs. And once you kill off the good germs, it is like indirectly taking too much oral antibiotics or something. You again kill off the good normal flora. Or the, so the vagina, the pH is usually about 3.5 to 4.5. It's acidic. It becomes less acidic only during menses, at the time of ovulation, and during pregnancy. It, mm -hmm. it becomes, pH is about 5 to 6. The neutral pH is 7.1. Anything more than 7.1 is alkaline. So the vaginal flora helps to keep the vagina in an acidic form at the pH of 3.5 to 4.5. And during menses, it becomes 5 to 6. And that's where more a fungal infection or yeast infection occurs. So I we see a lot of women coming to us now and say very common they have what we call fungal infection, they call it thrush. Okay, we call thrush, yeast, fungus, moniliasis or candida. It's all the same. It's, it's fungal infection. Imagine a small piece of bread, you put some water and leave it in a dark corner and you get fungus growing. So mm -hmm. the vagina is a very good culture medium. It's dark, it's moist and it's warm. And when we use all this douching uh, or feminine hygiene products, we're actually killing off the normal flora. And then opportunistic bacteria like fungus and sometimes other things, other bacteria can go. So uh, we see patients who have recurrent infection. They come every three, four months for fungal infection, complaining of itch or discharge, usually curdy white discharge, and this called thrush. So we advise our patients to throw away all this feminine hygiene. You may want to wash with just warm water, no need to use any soap or unnecessary things, just warm water and that's clean. Because not don't get obsessed with uh, feminine hygiene, because there are lots of products in the market. So they may not be ideal or they may not be very good because you may be killing off the good bacteria, good germs. Okay. Doctor, we have one last question we can have for the time we have today. Uh, we have a question here, how to treat regular periods with no other, with no diseases, there is no clear diseases. Uh, the patient is 28 years old and the periods come after 14 to 17 days in the last four months. Okay, first thing is we must always rule out three important things. When you have irregular period or the period is prolonged or comes too often, we want to make sure you don't have any tumor. Tumor doesn't mean cancer. It could be small fibroid or endometriosis or some polyps in the cervix or in the uterus. So these are all non-cancerous things. So we had to rule out that by doing a simple uh, scan and a vaginal examination. 
sometimes a pap smear. Second thing, we want to rule out infection, any sort of infection. Third thing, third thing, we want to rule out. Third, third thing we want to rule out is uh, pregnancy. Sometimes pregnancies can cause irregular uh, bleeding, especially if the pregnancy is outside the womb, called ectopic pregnancy, or sometimes even a miscarriage, early miscarriage. Patient may not realize she was pregnant. So early miscarriages can also cause uh, irregular period. So these three things must be ruled out. Any tumors, any infection, any pregnancies. So once you have ruled out all these things, then we call it hormonal imbalance. In medical terms, we call it dysfunctional uterine bleed. That means the hormones are not secreted regularly from the brain to the ovaries to this. And first few questions we had asked our patients is, are you stressed? Because stress can cause hormone imbalance. Mm -hmm. Or oh, have you been traveling? Because sometimes uh, air hostesses, uh, stewardess, flying different time zones, uh, day and night and all that, can cause emotional changes, uh, brain hormones, and cause irregular period. Work stress, exam tension, all this can cause irregular period because of the hormones. Then we ask them whether you are taking some herbal products. Sometimes when some women like to take, take some beauty products like collagen and things like that, or in, in sometimes in this part of the world, we call it jamu, or some products which uh, women like to take to look young, but they contain a lot of herbal products which affect the, the the clotting mechanism of the blood. So mm -hmm. they cause heavy period or sometimes even irregular periods. And this is also common in women after childbirth. Sometimes they take a lot of hormones, including sometimes even a bird's nest and things like that. You know, sometimes can contain certain products which keeps the blood thin. It's like indirect aspirin. People take aspirin or this cardiprin to keep the blood thin in old age. Correct. So these herbal products contain very crude form of this sort of products, which doesn't allow the blood to clot. So these things are the, another thing which you have to ask our patients. So whether you're stressed, what type of work you're doing, whether you're traveling, uh, have you been taking some dietary products to lose weight, sudden loss of weight, or sudden change in environment, sudden change in uh, dietary habits, all this can cause hormonal imbalance. So once all this has been ruled out, then we know that it could be due to hormones, and we can use simple uh, hormonal tablets. Some, sometimes even you use a contraceptive pill or something for two or three months to regulate the period. Okay? Mm -hmm. Because you must remember, it's not good to bleed more than a week. If you bleed continuously or irregularly, it drains you. You become emotionally weak. You feel tired all the time. And then you can become even anemic. Loss of blood can cause irritability. You become very irritable. You become very stressed, you become lethargic, you become uninterested in the environment, all because you're losing blood. And chronic blood loss is very bad. Uh, you don't realize it, but you see, acute blood loss, like if you meet in an accident or accidentally cut your hand, the blood loss is immediate, but it builds back. A chronic blood loss, especially patients with heavy menses or gastric bleeding or hemorrhoids or piles, these are chronic, slow, and your body slowly gets adjusted you don't realize it, but without your knowledge, you're becoming tired, weak, and so on. So this is not so good for women, especially if you're having frequent periods or irregular periods. So as long as you rule out all these conditions and all these products that you're taking, then the doctors will prescribe you some hormonal tablets. And usually, three to four months later, you'll regulate. But if, despite the hormones, tablets, you still continue to bleed, I'm sure your doctor will then look for deeper to see whether he has missed something or he may even want to do a special examination under anesthesia, do a DNC, endometrial sampling to make sure that he has not missed anything. Because most mm -hmm. of the time, if it's a hormonal problem with the hormones, you will be fine. But the important thing is when a doctor starts you on hormones, you must make sure you must complete the course. And you cannot okay. forget okay. to take well, two days, stop off. So some women will take for a few days and they say, oh, my menses have stopped. I'm mean, okay. They'll stop the cost. And then they start bleeding again. So you must take it in a very cyclical, at least as what the doctor has prescribed. So remembering to take the tablets in the right time, 
for the right duration is important. So I always tell my patients, when you take hormones, don't treat them like sweets. You must take it seriously and complete the course. Only then you can get the regular results. Yes. Uh, that's all the time we have for today, doctor. It's uh, one complete hour. Thank you so much for all the tips and all the information that you gave us and for answering the question. We hope to have you again, doctor, in maybe different topics. Thank you so much. Okay, most welcome and thanking me, thanking you and your team for having me. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. أعزائي متابعي مجلة أسواق شكرا لكم على تواجدكم معنا اليوم ومشاهدة هذا البث المباشر مع دكتور سيفا موهن الاستشاري في طب النساء والولادة من مستشفى كي بي جي دمنسارة والسلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته